I was at a meeting at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, interested in how health differs in different parts of Baltimore. And in fact, I wrote about Baltimore in my book, The Health Gap. Speaking in the US about health inequalities, about a month before I was giving a talk, Baltimore erupted in civil unrest. The precipitant of the civil disorder in Baltimore was the killing of a black man by the police, or should I say one more, killing of a black man by the police. That was the precipitant, but the underlying cause was inequality. Because when I say Baltimore erupted, in fact, it was one part of Baltimore, the poor part. Upton Druid, where life expectancy for men is 62. In the rich part of Baltimore, the richest part, it's 82. If you live in Roland Park, the rich part of Baltimore, and you want to see what it's like to be living in an area where life expectancy is 20 years shorter, you could fly to Ethiopia. Alternatively, you could go a few kilometers across town and see what life is like in Upton Druid. Every second house is condemned as unfit for human habitation. Single parent families, the kids do poorly in school, high rates of dropout. One third of children aged 10 to 17 are arrested each year for some juvenile disorder in the poor part of Baltimore, one third each year. High rates of non-fatal shootings, high rates of homicide, high levels of adult unemployment. And the whole thing's completely different across town in leafy Roland Park, huge inequalities. And crime, high rates of crime and civil disorder seem to go along with high rates of ill health. Think about Australia. Think about the scandal of what's happened to young Aboriginal men in the prison system. Think about the high rates of crime in the Northern Territory, the disproportionate representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands, Islanders in the prison system, and the 10 and a half year gap in life expectancy for men and 9.4 year gap for women in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. I hasten to add that inequalities in health in Australia are not confined to the differences between the Indigenous and the non-Indigenous population, but even in the mainstream population. If we classify people by education, by income, by employment, the lower the position in the hierarchy, the higher the risk. How do we deal with this? The evidence points strongly to the fact that most of these inequalities arise because of the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age, and inequities in power, money and resources that give rise to these inequities and in the conditions of daily life what I described in Baltimore, or you could describe on the fringes of country towns in Australia, or indeed in deprived parts of inner cities in Australia. In fact, the opening lines of my book, The Health Gap, was what good does it do to treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick? What we do as doctors is treat people is it any part of our responsibility or function to attend to the conditions that made people sick? I spent a year as president of the World Medical Association, something of a contradiction, having said that the key determinants of health are not what doctors do for patients. There I was as president of the World Medical Association. And I said as my mission, 
trying to get doctors and national medical associations engaged in action on the social determinants of health. We produced a report and we said there are five things that doctors and medical associations can do. Education and training, seeing the patient in a broader perspective. Three, thinking about the health service as employer conditions, not just for doctors and nurses, but for drivers and clerks and lab assistants and cleaners and the like. The fourth is working in partnership. And the fifth is advocacy, the doctors as advocates. And I think there's a clear role for individual doctors and for doctors' organisations in all five of those. Education and training, of course. And we've been involved, for example, with the Royal College of Physicians in London in producing an online course for physicians on social determinants of health. And we've been involved with other of the medical royal colleges. We've produced a MOOC, a mass open online course, with the World Medical Association. The second, seeing the patient in a broader perspective. Let me just take two examples from the end of life and the beginning of life, starting with the end of life, older people. In Britain, we've had a crisis of the National Health Service, and most people now think that this increased demand in accident and emergencies is because of the reduction in spending on social care for older people. Because it's more difficult for older people to live supported in the community, they're flooding the accident emergency rooms when they get sick. It's absolutely vital that the health service work in concert with housing, social protection, social services, community nurses and the like to help older people remain independent. We know that social isolation kills older people. Making sure that people are not left lonely and alone is vital. At the other end of life, looking at early child development, any doctor who deals with young children knows the importance of the input of carers, family life, and if for whatever reason parents are unable fully to fulfill that caring role, the importance of supporting parents and families and providing other services. We know in the Nordic countries, for example, state subsidized childcare is available to all when the child's one year old. And these state subsidized childcare is staffed by highly trained, well-paid individuals. Not surprisingly, the Nordic countries do very well globally on measures of early childhood and inequities in early childhood. The other side of early childhood, so one part is good caring, support, social, emotional, psychological, cognitive, linguistic development of children. But the other side is preventing adverse child experiences, drunkenness, drugs, domestic violence, are all adverse child experiences that damage children for life. For example, an estimate in Britain is that if you could potentially get rid of adverse child experiences, there would be fewer teenage pregnancies, less smoking, less drug use, less alcohol use of those young people when they became adults, and a reduction of 52% in domestic violence. In other words, young people who were subject to adverse child experiences, when they become adults, are more likely to be perpetrators of domestic violence and victims of domestic violence. It's absolutely key to be looking at the broader perspective. I was in the West Midlands area, Birmingham, 
in London invited by the fire services, the fire and rescue service. The firefighters go out into the community to deal with fires, of course, but they're also interested in preventing fires. But while they're up, they go into people's homes and they're dealing with the social determinants of health. They get young people involved in activities. They support older people. If they suspect domestic violence, they don't say, we're not equipped to deal with domestic violence. They, therefore, it's not my job. They say, we're not equipped, but we know who to call, who is equipped to deal with domestic violence. So I come back to the GPs and say, look what the firefighters are doing. What are you doing? When getting involved with the World Medical Association, I say to them, to these national medical associations, remember why you went into medicine, animated by a passion for social justice. You wanted to help people get better. And if people's health is suffering, because of their social conditions, surely we have a responsibility to deal with those social conditions. And I present my message of, in this world of post-fact politics, my message of evidence-based policy presented in a spirit of social justice. I was chairing a meeting of a new commission on equity and health inequalities in the Americas in Washington, D.C. And I found myself in the mall of Washington in the Martin Luther King area. And Martin Luther King says, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love. And I thought, unarmed truth, yep, evidence-based policy. Unconditional love, yep, a spirit of social justice. He says it better than I. Martin Luther King says, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. Colleagues, those of us who are concerned about health inequities are concerned with social justice. All over Europe, in the United States, there's some unfortunate politics going on at the moment that doesn't look like it's right being triumphant. But we are on the side of justice and we will be triumphant.